I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24 this morning. We're going to be on the road to Emmaus. That great testimony of our resurrected Lord as he was revealing himself to another series of individuals. It's interesting that Christ's first appearances were not to mass groups, but rather to one individual here, three or four there. Here we have a group of two. Following, immediately following the events of this section is when Christ makes his first appearance before the assembled disciples, ten of them present, plus other individuals. And then that kicks off a few, uh, a week or so later, his ministry in Galilee where over 500 people saw him at one time. But the interesting thing is, as we've alluded to, uh, that Christ revealed himself to individuals. This is a picture of what is called the Emmaus Road in Israel. It's a very indicative of what is left of Roman roads in that part of the world to this day. There are mile markers which are not particularly pictured here along the way to let them know when they had passed uh, the certain distances. And you'll see the border of the pathway as well as kind of the, the uh, stones pressed into the dirt. This is a typical country part of the Roman road system. And this is what is believed to be the site of the village of Emmaus. We're not entirely certain. All scripture tells us is that it was seven miles from Jerusalem. We don't know the direction exactly, but it is believed it is to the northwest, and that's where these remains are located. All of that to say that it really doesn't matter if we have the physical evidences. What we do have is the scriptural statement of what Jesus Christ did. So we're going to start by reading verses 13 through 18. It'll be on the screen if you want to follow it there, and also you may follow it in the text before you. But scripture says, that very day, speaking of the resurrection day of Christ, the first day of the week, Sunday, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said, well, I'm sorry, we stopped the reading there. I was going to continue. I get excited. <coughs> these verses just relate the encounter as it begins between Christ and these dejected disciples. I call them dejected because at the end of verse 17, it says that they were sad. And that is the indication that they're all burdened down by what has been going on. But it's interesting to note as we find them here walking on the road, apparently returning home. That's the best guess I can come to. They're continuing on with life. Each of us who has experienced the death of a loved one understands the pain sometimes that is associated with continuing on with life. And the heartbreak that comes to us as we think everyone else is just going on like nothing has happened, but my world is turned upside down. And that's the state of mind of these disciples. They're continuing on with life, however reluctantly. Because they had had great aspirations, great ideas of what was going to happen. They're probably on their way home, as I have said, after the Passover celebrations. You remember Passover was celebrated Thursday into Friday of that previous week. Saturday was a high Sabbath day because it was not only a Sabbath, but it was also the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the first day of the week, Sunday, was first fruits. And so the, devote, the devoted people of Israel would have stayed in Jerusalem through 
the celebration of first fruits would have been, which would have been early in the morning on Sunday. These guys have stuck around most of the day, and they're now going back in the late afternoon toward their home, as I take it, in Emmaus. This is approximately seven miles from Jerusalem, converting the measurements that are there in Scripture. And if you think about how long it would take you to walk seven miles, the average pace of an individual walking without trying to gain a physical benefit of exercise is something around two and a half to three miles per hour. So you can figure it out. They could be on the road for as much as three hours as they're walking and talking. They had a lot of time ahead of them to talk. They're as, as they're walking, they're conversing about all of the recent events. What recent events? Particularly the crucifixion of Christ that had occurred three days prior on Friday. But they're also now talking, as we find out when they begin to speak with Jesus Christ, about the confusing reports that have begun to circulate regarding the possibility of a resurrection. And I phrase it just that way because I'm trying to get in the minds of these individuals. And I say possibility because they report to Jesus the facts, but without any personal attachment or confidence that they're true. And when Jesus approaches them, they're totally unaware of who he is. They're unaware of his identity. There are several human reasons for that, and there is a supernatural reason for that as well that the text deals with first of all they were Jesus overtakes them as they're walking and they're prevented from recognizing him just emotionally because they're absorbed by their conversation have you ever been in a conversation like that that you're so committed to what you're talking about that you pretty much block out everything that's going on around you Hopefully you're not walking into traffic when that happens. But But you've seen the things on the internet of individuals talking on their phone and walking into a public fountain and drenching themselves. Uh, A lot of accidents have happened just that way. And it's even more the case when you're absorbed in talking to another individual, person to person. But not only are they absorbed by what they're already talking about, they're not even expecting Christ's resurrection. And that seems odd to us, doesn't it? Why does that seem odd? Because Christ repeatedly said he would rise again. In the notes that you have there with you, that were in the bulletin this morning, I've listed about half a dozen different places in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Christ had specifically said That he was going to be killed, he was going to be buried, and three days later he would rise from the dead. They should have been expecting it, shouldn't they? Christ gives them another reason why they should should have been expecting it when he begins to talk, but let's hold that off for just a few moments. But the other thing we need to realize is that they're providentially hindered from recognizing him And I supply the reason that is true in my mind to further their understanding of Scripture. Think in your life of how God has dealt with you, perhaps not granting you the request that you have before him. And his purpose in not granting that request, as you look at it over a distance of time, is to teach you to trust him more. It seems contrary to all logic, doesn't it? You'd think a quick answer would foster that confidence, but no, many times it's when we have to persist in prayer in spite of the fact that we're not getting what we want or need, that we understand that God is truly more important than the need that we're experiencing. And when Christ begins to open the scriptures to them, he's not giving them new scripture. He's giving them the old scripture that they just hadn't thought about, hadn't processed. Do you think there are any portions of scripture you haven't processed? Do you think there's anything that you really have just 
skipped over, glibly. Certainly all of us have those blind spots in Scripture. They're not just in your mirrors in your car. We all have that tendency to just grab the surface meaning of things and not dig deeper to understand what God has for us. But as Christ appears to them, the fact that they don't recognize him makes it quite obvious that he's not appearing in the dazzling brightness that he displayed in the transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17 verse 2 says that Christ was transfigured before him and his face shone like the sun. I think they would have noticed that on the road to Emmaus. That's not what's going on here. And his clothes became white as light. The idea is that there was light emitting from his person through his clothing. What they were seeing is the unveiled glory of Jesus Christ, which we will all see who know Christ as Savior when we're with him in glory. And we'll share in that glory. But it's also not the glory of the angels that appeared at the tomb. They similarly are described in Matthew 28, verse 3, as having an appearance like lightning. That's talking about the brilliance, the dazzling brightness of their countenance, their face. And their clothing as white as snow. Christ appears in a more natural, normal form. I don't think his face was altered in spite of the fact that in Mark chapter 16, it says that he appeared in a different form to two as they walked. I don't think that means a different face than what he normally had before he died. It was just that they didn't understand who he was. That's what's being emphasized there. And the reaction of these two disciples, as we read it there in verse 17, is lost a little bit in the King James translation, where, this, where the verse, the end of verse 17, simply says, Christ asks them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk and are sad? Mixing it all together, where it's, it appears there is limited punctuation in the Greek text. But question marks generally look like our semicolons you know, the comma with a dot over it, that's the Greek question mark. And that appears after walk, as you walk. And so there is an element there that's missing, a verb that is in the best manuscripts that is translated here, you standing still. And that's really what we're seeing there. In other words, there was an incredulous reaction to his question. What is this that you're talking about? This presupposes that Christ had been listening to them a little bit as they walked. You know how it is. You're walking down a path and someone joins with your twosome and makes it a threesome. And they might be a little behind or to the side. And without much interruption, the conversation continued. And then all of a sudden he says, so what is this that you're talking about? Not that he was unaware, but he desires to produce specific answers. It's quite, kind of like God, and I believe it was Jesus Christ, entering the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned. And he says, where are you? That doesn't mean he didn't know. <laughs> it means he's trying to pull from them an admission of their guilt. And so it is with many of Christ's questions to the disciples throughout his ministry here on earth. It was designed to provoke a response. A questioning style is good in teaching scripture to help us face realities, decisions that we need to make. So they stood still and looked sad. In other words, Jesus' question shocked them, surprised them into stopping very suddenly. Not a planned stop, just a stop of bewilderment. Do you really not know what we're talking about? That's kind of the reaction they had had. Their sadness is due to the death of Jesus, but it is also due to the fact of their disillusion. Disillusion referring to the fact that they didn't know what to make of the circumstances and even their confidence in Jesus as 
a man sent from God is shaken. And that's all going to have to be shored up, and it becomes obvious as Christ begins to direct himself to the need of the moment. One, identified as Cleophas or Cleopas, is amazed to think that anyone did not know about these situations. And there's good reason for him to be so incredulous. Christ catches up to them from the rear, presupposing he had been in Jerusalem and been around during the last couple of days. It's Cleopas' opinion that he probably had been there through the Passover celebration and that, like they, is returning home wherever that might be. But you see, crucifixion was a very public event. It was intended by Rome to be a public spectacle. Everyone was to take notice and the description of the crimes of the criminal were placed above him on the cross and that would be a warning to people, don't do this or you're going to share his fate. Roman and Jewish law demanded that such executions happen outside the city walls. From Rome's perspective, it was merely a matter of respect. They tried to keep peace. Now, Rome would come back in 70 AD and they would lose all perspective and just absolutely sack Jerusalem and indeed the entire country of Israel because of the repeated rebellions that had been going on. But at this time, they're still trying to preserve the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And so any executions that were going to be handled would be taken outside the city to preserve the sanctity, the safety of the inner part of the city. These cruci the crucifixion of Christ, we're told in Scripture, happened in a place known by two names. It's really two languages. The first is Golgotha, which is Aramaic, which means literally the skull. The other word is Greek. It is Calvary, but you notice the Greek words here, if you can sound them out. They're kind of like English words, except the V's are N's. Cranion. What does that sound like? Cranium. So Calvary and Golgotha mean the same thing. They're just two different languages. Anyone reading either Matthew's account or Luke's account back in the time when they were written in the first century would understand that what this name referred to was the typical place of execution. Some said it was because it was called the, uh, the place of the skull or the cranium because of the look, the shape of the hill. That's possible. But the fact is that this was the normal place where executions would be handled in the area of Jerusalem. It was beside a well-traveled road. I make that conclusion because Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, speaks of the passers-by who were mocking Christ. Individuals, not passers-by in the sense of deliberately passing by the cross, but passing the road that was nearby. Again, this is a very public spectacle and intended to be so. In my opinion, humble as it is, I believe this probably occurred just outside the Damascus Gate on the northwest quadrant of the uh, city of Jerusalem and not in the traditional location inside the city. I'm thinking in a few weeks of starting a series on the land of Israel and using a lot of the pictures that I took when I was there a few years ago. Because I think there's great value in seeing some of the places, even though they're not anywhere near what they were back in the day. But when you look at the traditional site for the death and burial of Christ, well, I, I just say from my own perspective, when I looked at it, I was absolutely convinced this can't be the place. Certainly it's not the spirit that should be here. But outside the city, there is another location that is very likely similar to, if not the very place, where the crucifixion and the burial of Christ and resurrection occurred. And so as a result of this being such a public spectacle, it was really inconceivable to imagine that anyone in the area of Jerusalem at that time could be ignorant of the death of Christ. So Cleopas had a reason for reacting the way he did. But again, it wasn't because Christ didn't know. It was because he was trying to get the reaction and open a door for ministry. 
It's as if Cleopas is saying, how could you have been in Jerusalem any length of time, even as a foreign visitor, and not know what has happened? Certainly, it would have been the topic of conversation of anyone, everyone, even the chief priests and scribes. But there's more going on here, and let's start reading verses 19 through 24, where Scripture says, And he, that is Christ, said to them, these two men, What things? So he's provoking them a little further. And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us, other disciples, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. A very succinct, factual account of what they knew. There were other things that were happening that they did not know about, perhaps had transpired after they had left Jerusalem. But I title this section, Disappointed Expectations. We had hoped. That phrase accurately expresses what was in their mind. They begin talking in verse 19 about who Jesus was because the life of Jesus had amazed them, had grabbed their attention so much that they became followers of him. When they describe him of Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth, it was because other people went by this name, Yeshua. It's actually the same name as Joshua in the Old Testament. And this name, though it was frequent, when you said in the public, Jesus of Nazareth, people knew who you were talking about. Oh, the prophet, the miracle worker. And these are the points that are being talked about by these guys. They say, we are convinced that he was a prophet. They don't go to the point of Deuteronomy 18, verse 19, the prophet that Moses had prophesied about, but that is likely in their minds as well. They say that he was a man mighty in deeds, speaking of his mighty miracles. John 21, verse 25 says that if all the things that Christ did while he was on earth were written, even the world could not contain the books. That's obvious hyperbole. But it is to say that the New Testament would be a whole lot bigger. It would be uncomfortable to carry it all around. (laughs) And if you had multiple people talking about it from different perspectives, your library could fill up pretty fast. But as Matthew, or as John says in the end of chapter 20, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there's a purpose for giving us what we have and elipting what we don't. They also had heard his powerful words. John 7, 46 is when the group that was sent to arrest Jesus by the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin says, go out there and arrest him, bring him in. And instead they come back saying, no man ever spoke like this man. And the Sanhedrin throws back that stinging reply, are you also going to follow him? What an embarrassment. Because his words were so powerful and so disingenuous in the sense that he wasn't trying to impress anyone. He was simply speaking the truth. And when it says that he did all of these things before God and men, it is as much as to say all of these things met with the approval of God and man. It is as much as a protest against the death of Christ that they are expressing here. In that time frame, you would have to have been very careful about how you expressed your protest. You might well be the next victim. But just as Jesus' life had amazed them, his death shocked them. 
They should have been prepared. They had been given all of this information, and yet they were unprepared that Jesus would be crucified as a common criminal. And this is the description they give, that Jesus was first of all delivered up by the Jewish priests and rulers. In the providence of God, it couldn't be any other way, but think of what would have happened if it could have transpired that they had taken the execution in their own hands. How would they have executed Jesus Christ? By crucifixion? Never. They're not going to touch the convicted. They would have thrown stones as they did with Stephen. And that would have violated many of the Old Testament prophecies. We're going to look at Psalm 22 this evening. I hope you'll be on hand for that. It's part of what Christ undoubtedly taught these men on the road to Emmaus. But instead, he was executed by Roman soldiers. They're not mentioned in these verses. But the idea of delivering them up, delivering Christ up, and then he was crucified expresses that idea. They were executed by Roman soldiers, and that's why the crucifixion happened. That was Rome's preferred method of exterminating criminals at that time, or just simply taking care of rabble-rousers that they suspected might cause a problem. So what these men actually give to Christ is what I would call a very factual report, but without any theological perspective. Isn't it amazing how you can get an accounting of something without really knowing what happened? And I'm not just talking about the distortion that happens from newscaster bias. I'm talking about the fact that we don't always understand what we see. And that was the case of these individuals. They were as those for whom Christ prayed from the cross in Luke 23. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Or another passage, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 to 8, which tell us that if the leaders of the world had known who Christ was, they would not have crucified him, but they did not know so that God's will would be performed. Know that behind circumstances is the hand of omniscience and omnipotence. But their hopes were dashed. Why were their hopes dashed? And this is a very good translation of this word, which may be in your Bible, that we trusted. The word is actually the Greek word elpidzo, which comes from the word, the noun hope. So we had hoped is a very good idea. A very good translation of what's going on here. In other words, what they're saying is they had expectations. Remember, the main theme here in this section is disappointed expectations. Let me put it this way. Wrong ideas always lead to disappointment. Are we set for wrong ideas in our minds? To look at our political situation in our country, I think many of us react because of the disappointment. Perhaps we thought we had biblical reason to not expect what we're seeing. I could give you many reasons to expect worse. But the fact of the matter is, I think we react to situations many times based on a disappointment that is caused by a wrong idea going in. The redemption of Israel that they mentioned here was primarily a political thought. It was very popular in that day. I'm not saying that it had no connotation at all dealing with salvation. But more it was a rescue of the political structure and the religious structure to place them in prominence as they had been in the day of David or the day of Solomon. And so this redemption of Israel that they mentioned. We had thought he would be he that would redeem Israel. We thought he was going to break Rome's yoke and he was going to give ascendancy to the kingdom. Remember, that was what was going on in John chapter 6. They, people wanted to come and take him by force and make him king. And the result of that was that Jesus taught, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life. And that caused a lot of people to leave. 
That was a quite, kind of a different invitation than is practiced in many evangelical circles today. In fact, he says to his disciples, will you also go away? It's almost as if he's suggesting, why don't you leave too? You see, because Christ wasn't dependent on human acceptance to know he was in the will of God, many times human acceptance is a trap. So they're confused about who Christ is, about is he the Christ? I think they're back to John the Baptist questions. Are you he that was coming to fulfill prophecy? And as I've suggested, we face similar difficulties if we confuse national pride with the divine will. Let me be clear. Some think that the United States is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies to Israel. That had, in previous generations, been called heresy. I like what somebody said, I found the USA in, in Old Testament prophecy. It's right there, the center three letters of the word Jerusalem. And that's as close as you'll get. There is nothing in prophecy that demands the presence of the United States of America at the end times of the tribulation or the millennial kingdom. There's no prophecy that guarantees our national survival. And I think we do well not to be invested in that because there is a greater kingdom. So patriotism has to have its balance, its check and balance with biblical realism. Not that patriotism is wrong, but it can be wrong-headed. And when we sing a song like God Bless America, I ask the question, how is that possible without repentance? God Convict America would be a really good song to sing. God shed his grace on thee, the grace of repentance, the grace of salvation, certainly. But most people, when they sing that, they're thinking of prosperity, aren't they? But enough of that rabbit trail. Let's get back on the road to Emmaus. The reports from the tomb that these men mentioned are not mentioned as restoring their hope, but rather as an additional confusing element. They're baffled by it. What can this all mean? The fact that they're not curious enough to stay in Jerusalem and investigate says something about the unbelief that's in their hearts, doesn't it? That in the midst of this confusion, they decide, well, we better go home. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Unless you've got a job. And, you know, that's very likely what the deal was. They're heading home. they got to get to work. They've taken off quite a number of days with all of the celebration. When they describe here in verse 22 the report of the women, and it says they amazed us or they astonished us, the word literally means that the women's report put them out of their wits. That's pretty serious. It just completely befuddled them. They had no clue what to make of this. The women reported seeing angels who said, Jesus is alive. And the disciples, Peter and John, to be specific, had gone out to confirm that the tomb was indeed empty. But these two men, as they walk back to Emmaus, do not know of anyone who has seen the resurrected Jesus. So they're again confused. They don't know what to make of all of this. And they're headed to Emmaus in apparent unbelief. But they're not left there. Verses 25 to 31 read as follows. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Oops, back up here. 
When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. In these verses, we have divine illumination. God taking it upon himself in the form of his son to present the truth that these people desperately needed to hear. The first thing out of the mind of Christ, out of the mouth of Christ, just like on the Sea of Galilee when he calms the waves, is what? A rebuke. A rebuke of faithlessness, of unbelief. It is a gentle but a firm rebuke that he gives to them. The word foolish or fools means senseless ones. Those who are dull of understanding, specifically of the events that have just transpired in the light of what Scripture says. And we're still told to be discerners of the times. Individuals connected with the newspaper or the news of the day, but through the lens of Scripture. That's still our responsibility. These individuals didn't see the one as connected to the other. And so I would say that, and that, well, Christ calls them also slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. I think that little word all is very important. They were believing some of it. The redemption of Israel, the Messiah coming to give this restoration, but they're not applying all of it. The suffering and the glory, the suffering that results in the glory, they're just not wanting to see that at all. That's not convenient to their theology. I caution us against rejecting that which is inconvenient to our theology if Scripture teaches it. I mentioned the doctrines of election and predestination for just two examples. They don't mean what everyone says they mean, but they mean something. And we do well to find that meaning and not ignore it. But their confusion then, I would say, is understandable. But their unbelief is unacceptable. And that's the way Christ deals with them. He gently and patiently explains the situations in light of Scripture and then demands their faith. He gives them a disclosure of truth which any of us are envious of. We would love to have been there to hear what Christ had to say, wouldn't we? I think we can expect a reprise of that message when we get to glory. I'll vote for it. What happens? Christ here says, did you not know that it is necessary? This word gives us to understand that Christ knew he had no other route open to him to procure the salvation of human souls. There was no other plan. This was not then accidental. See, that's part of the confusion of these people. They don't see the death of Christ as integral to the plan of God. But Christ is telling them it was necessary. This had to happen, and you should have known it from the Old Testament. Nor were these acts of men merely unfortunate. They were rather exactly what God had planned, as are all the events of our lives. But specifically this, notice what Acts 4, verses 27 and 28 have to say. For truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is the prayer of the disciples following the initiation of persecution against Peter and John. They come back to the assembly and pray for boldness. And they give us this theological perspective of the events that these two men were talking about hopelessly and despondently. This was God effecting his plan. And the result of all of that is that Christ was compelled to suffer. 
and be glorified in the suffering and after the suffering. Because Scripture demanded His suffering for sin, and we can see that through Old Testament Scripture. Just a couple of references thrown here before you. Genesis 3.15, the crushed heel of Christ. We have Psalm 22, the shepherd giving his life for the sheep. And Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. All of these things were available They were in Scripture at this time. Not that every one of the disciples had their own personal copy, but the fact is that it was all written. And God expects that if it is written, you should know about it. Ignorance is no excuse. Anyone who appears before the great white throne of judgment and says, I didn't know that Christ was the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That's not going to buy them even a moment's relief from hell. The fact that you did not know says that you did not care enough to find out because it was written and it remains written. So these people were expected to know what the Old Testament Scripture said in spite of the fact that they didn't have their own personal copy. Scripture declared that the glory of Christ would also result from this. And that's indicated in several passages that perhaps we just read over and don't really understand. First of all, the statement that the Father would be pleased in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, He shall see the anguish of His soul and be satisfied. God pleased with the suffering of His Son. That sacrifice not only pleasing God, but being acceptable to God, which the two are linked, but I separate them just simply so we consider it thoroughly. His sacrifice would be accepted, and then He would be exalted to the Father's right hand. Psalm 110, verse 1. Sit on my right hand, the Father says to the Son, until I make your enemies your footstool. And Christ's request in John chapter 17, verse 5, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That glory would again be his. So the glory was there, but it was connected to the suffering of Christ as well. Because Old Testament Scripture had prophesied all of this. And when Christ begins to explain this to them, He is taking them, Scripture says, from Moses and through all the prophets. If the entirety of the three hours walk, or a good two hours of it were available, you see why it's going to be impossible this evening to put everything in that Christ might have suggested or taught. And so Psalm 22 will be our focus. But these men are hearing Christ explain thoroughly Everything that Moses said about his glory and his suffering, not every prophecy regarding Christ. For instance, second advent prophecies were not part of what Christ was talking about. He also wouldn't have been talking about theophanies or Christophanies of the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord and identifying that. But he would have seen to the explanation of that promise in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. He would have taken them through the sacrifices on into Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and other passages explaining thoroughly that Christ's suffering and glory were right there to be seen. And here's an interesting statement from A.T. Robertson, a commentarist from uh, nearly 200 years ago now. He says, Jesus found himself in the Old Testament, a thing that some modern scholars do not seem able to do. What an amazing statement. So true. That Jesus is right there for us to see. And the eye of faith sees him. And then there's the revelation of Christ in verses 28 to 31 where we're told that he acted as if he would go on in his journey, not that he was trying to deceive them in any way, but absent an invitation, he would have continued until out of their sight. 
But knowing that they would give this invitation, he was awaiting their invitation to what probably was their own home. It reminds me of Revelation 3 verse 20. If we will answer Christ as he knocks on the door, he will come in and dine with us and we with him. And he does that with these men. He takes up the unleavened bread. Had to be unleavened bread. This is a devout Jewish home. These men have just come from religious observances there in Jerusalem. They would not have any leaven in their homes for nearly another week. So it's unleavened bread that, they, that Christ picks up. Isn't it interesting that he's invited in as the guest and he immediately begins to act like the host? And that's kind of, again, what Revelation 3 verse 20 says. He'll come in and he'll provide the banquet. He takes the unleavened bread, breaks it, blesses it, distributes it. And then Scripture says that he opened their eyes, that their eyes were opened. I accredit it directly to him, to the Father either way. He opened their eyes to recognize them, but then immediately vanished from their sight. Why do you think he did that? Why didn't he stay so that they could worship him, so that they could express gratitude for what he's just done? Well, the reason is because he wants that truth to be known. It's not enough that these two know. It's never enough that a person comes to Christ. That's not the end game. That is a milestone, but then Christ wants us to be his witnesses, to share that message with others. And so we come to verses 32 through 35. They said to one another, these two men who were left there just absolutely enraptured that they've just seen Christ. Did not our hearts burn within us while, we t- while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, that is Peter. Then they, that is these two men we're talking with, told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Exactly what Christ wanted. These are demonstrated truths. They're demonstrated by a series of witnesses. The women aren't mentioned in this passage. They're mentioned previously. They were faithful to the charge that was given to them. They went and reported. Peter to the other disciples. And these initial reports explain why all of the disciples are gathered together except Thomas, as we'll find out in a few moments. But the demonstrated truth came, first of all, in Christ's own teaching of verse 32. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us in the way? The teaching of biblical truth answers the hunger and thirst for righteousness in a believer. That is this burning. It was restored. They were so despondent and dejected that they didn't even realize what they were missing. And now all of a sudden, as truth comes to them, their heart responds to it, this burning. Do you feel that desire to know the word? Does that hunger and thirst create that burning in you to make you want to be in the word, to know more about it? Your presence here speaks to that. But I wonder how the hunger persists through the week. I trust that it does because it's like food. I don't care how good lunch is going to be as we adjourn here in a few moments and go and eat it. You're all going to want to eat something tomorrow, if not today, after that meal. doesn't matter how much you eat or what you eat, you're still going to want to eat more in short order. The same is true of spiritual truth. If you have a true heart for God, there is going to be that hunger and thirst for righteousness. But all he had done is open the scriptures. He wasn't telling funny stories. He wasn't telling about all of his exploits. These things frequently pass for preaching. I don't want to hear about... A person, I want to hear about Jesus Christ. 
I want to hear the word. And that's what we focus on here. We want people to have the response of one person <laughs> was leaving a service I had preached at. And they said, do you always preach right from the Bible like that? I hope so. I have no other text. There's nowhere else to get this connection to God. This is exactly how the Scripture should be handled. The Word should be central in the teaching because the Word is more important than the messenger. Anyone who tries to be that messenger that everyone wants to hear is probably missing out on something of the Word that people need to hear. It's not a popularity contest. It's all about the Word. But it's not only the teaching of Christ, it is also the, clu- the conclusion the disciples are gradually coming to. We're told that there were 11 gathered together. We know uh, through comparing John 20, verse 24, that on this occasion only 10 were there. Judas is obviously not there because he took his own life after he had betrayed Christ. Thomas is also not present, according to John chapter 20, verse 24. But the 11 is a collective description of this core group of disciples, whether or not all of them are present. And the fact is that a week later, all would be present. And they're discussing the various reports that have come to them through the day. Mary Magdalene, the other women, Peter, and now these two men that are before them. Their conclusion is the Lord has certainly risen. This word indeed, he has risen indeed. It is the idea of of a truth, certainly. With certainty, Jesus has risen because several of our number have seen him. And they mention here that Peter had seen him. There is one other reference to this, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5, where the Apostle Paul says that among all of the disciples, this inner group, this eleven. Peter was the first to see him, and then the twelve, also referring to the ten and then the eleven. The idea of the order of these visitations, we don't know when it was that Peter saw Christ. At least one commentator I came across thinks that Peter was the other member of this twosome on the road to Emmaus. I don't know why he would have been going to Emmaus since he was from Capernaum in the north. Well, that's on the way, but it's not really the same place. I don't know that we can't say with any certainty at all, but what we know is that twice Scripture affirms that among the disciples, Peter was the first to see Christ. Why is that important? Why would Christ have singled Peter out? Because Christ had something to say and Peter had something to say, right? Peter had a, a, a confession, a repentant moment to express, and Christ to express forgiveness. And then there's the testimony of these two from Emmaus, verse 35. Verse 32 had told us, I'm ahead of myself, it seems. You'll just have to take my word for it. These notes are supposed to be there. The testimony of the two from Emmaus is they returned immediately. As soon as Christ had vanished from their sight, they begin discussing, did not our hearts burn? That That was Jesus. And they immediately pick up and leave. Now, that's important because it was probably at the very earliest, 6 o'clock in the evening. And if it's going to take them nearly three hours, well, I'm going to suggest that they made better time going back to Jerusalem than on the way to Emmaus. Because their attitude is completely different. They're dejected on the way to Emmaus. They're jubilant. Their feet are barely touching the ground on the way back to Jerusalem. And so they probably made that trip a whole lot more quickly. But they may have arrived, they certainly arrived after sundown. It may have been as late as 9 o'clock in the evening. Hard to say. And immediately they burst in and start telling of their encounter with Jesus. And they told about how they recognized him as he broke the bread. All of these things and undoubtedly some of what he had told them along the way. But these post-resurrection experience of Christ to individuals and then to larger groups are each an exercise in faith building. Christ appears to Mary to buttress that weak faith, to the other women, to Peter. 
to these two men who are dejected and walking away from Jerusalem. Do you realize that Christ's appearance on the road to Emmaus was as much as to say, get back to Jerusalem where you belong. Your work can wait. There's something far more important. And they're going to get to see Christ for a second time. Quite an enviable status. Certainly a faith-building exercise, if ever there was one. There no longer are any doubts about who Jesus is. It's just the joy of coming to know the truth that they had ignored up to this point. You see, immediately after the resurrection of Christ, no one believed or understood the resurrection. No one. There wasn't anyone sitting around saying, just wait. Third day, it's going to happen. The women who went to the tomb weren't going with that expectation. What were they expecting to find? The body, so that they could wrap it and prepare it and so forth. No one was expecting a resurrection. But by the time of Christ's upper room visit, which appears immediately after the report of these two men from Emmaus, hearts were conditioned to believe, to receive the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gone were the doubts. And so I ask you a couple of questions. How is Christ building your faith today? What are the difficulties in your life? What are the things you think you can't do, you can't get by, you can't go on because of whatever? That's the faith builder that God has placed in your life. That is the thing that God is intent on growing your faith through. Don't think of it as a detour. It's the stepping stone doesn't matter how difficult it is. So the question, are you progressing toward greater faith? Are you allowing Christ to do this faith building in you? He will do it. But it's something we've got to work together on. Don't resist his faith building in you. It's going to be the blessing that you need. Not a hardship in any sense. And then share your growth with others. Other people need it too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we receive the comfort, then we give it back so that others are comforted with the same comfort that we've received. Let's bow our heads and our hearts for a moment of prayer and reflection. I would invite you, if God has spoken to you in a specific way regarding your faith in Jesus Christ, perhaps you've never come to true faith in Jesus Christ. Look me up or someone else here with us today in whom you have confidence so that you can get that matter settled so that you're not this faithless, unbelieving individual, but rather a person of faith. If your faith is in need of growing been teetering, turn that over to God and resolve by his grace to grow in faith as he intends that you should do. And please let me know how I can help in that process. That's why I'm here. Father, use your word to continue to burn within us, to teach us those things that we are reluctant to, to learn, even resistant to learn. Teach us that it is only by surrendering to your good and perfect work within us that our faith will be born and will grow. May none of us turn from these faith-building experiences that you bring into our lives. But rather, may we be like Abraham, whose faith faltered on several occasions and then shone through in bright, dazzling brilliance because of the work that God had done in him. May we each have that experience in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.